Hello, Ernest. Hello, Kim Scott. How are you today? I am doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. I'm doing wonderful. I'm excited for this uh, for this episode. Each week seems to get better and better as we as we dig into these meaty topics. So excited. Yeah, you know that I think I think that the the lesson is that the more you have these conversations, the, mm-hmm. the better they get. So have more of these. Our goal is to encourage other people to have these conversations too, right? Well, I agree, right? Because even you and I, we get more and more comfortable with each other, and yeah. therefore it's less intimidating to have some of the very candid conversations with each other. So I think you're right. There's a lot of learning there. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So what I'd like to do, if you're okay with it, is to talk about chapter six. So we're going to get into part two of the book because I'm editing that part right now and I need your wisdom. Great. So should I just jump in and read? Sure. That'd be great. All right. So we're moving past bias, prejudice, and bullying into discrimination, harassment, and physical violations. And this is chapter six. And it's called Explicitly Design Your Management Systems for Radical Respect. When managers have too much power, bias and prejudice give way to discrimination. Bullying gives way to verbal or psychological harassment. Unchecked power, whether positional power or physical power, size in other words, paves the way for the full range of physical violations ranging from the creepy hug to the violent assault. Unchecked power is bad. Powerlessness is worse. But the solution to powerlessness is not power. It's putting enough checks and balances on power so that people in positions of authority can be held accountable, are less likely to be corrupted, and don't rob people with less power of their agency. Most of us like to think that we are good people, and no matter how much power we had, we would behave well and use our power to mend a broken world. In his book, Enduring Love, Ian McEwan's main character gives voice to this sentiment. I know that if I had been the uncontested leader, the tragedy would not have happened. (laughs) I read this book (laughs) when I was CEO of a startup I co-founded. This line struck me hard because it was this moment when I realized that I had subconsciously believed a ridiculous thing. If I were in charge, if I had complete control over how my company was run with no interference from the board, discrimination and harassment wouldn't happen. But unfortunately, these and other bad things happened under my watch. Often, the very same bad things I thought had happened elsewhere because the leaders were assholes. It's so much easier and more satisfying to look for the individual scoundrel than to analyze the systems (laughs) that made it possible or perhaps even inevitable that bad things would happen. It's not enough for a leader to be a good person. A leader must build good systems, systems that put checks on everyone's power, including their own. Too many leaders reserve all their design cycles for their products. They over-delegate the design of their company's organizational structure and management systems to HR, but then under-resource HR and then disrespect HR when the systems don't work. If leaders don't (laughs) consciously and proactively design their management systems to limit the power of any one individual, including themselves, they're going to get systemic injustice. Why? Power. A growing body of research suggests that power does, does indeed corrupt and that uncontested leaders with good intentions wind up doing a lot of the bad things that uncontested leaders with bad intentions do. The more power a person has, the more likely their decision making is to be flawed by bias and prejudice. Research also shows that bias and prejudice, rather than rational decision making, often influence how resources are allocated by people with unchecked power. Increased power often means increased bullying. A survey of 775 corporate workers reported that rude, uncivil behavior were three times more likely to come from people above them in their organization. Too much power in one person's hand is not only bad for the people around the powerful person, it's bad for the person in the end. The different ways that power eventually leads to the downfall of the powerful are well explained in Berkeley psychologist uh, Dasher Keltner's The Power Paradox. Mm. Those in power tend to depersonalize those without power. 
As people gain power, they often begin to indulge in behaviors likely to make them lose their power. Unfortunately, once they have power, they usually don't lose it until they have done enormous damage to those around them. As author Moises Naim writes in his book, The End of Power, power no longer buys as much as it did in the past. From boardrooms to combat zones to cyberspace, battles for power are as intense as ever, but they are yielding diminishing returns. Understanding how power is losing its value and facing up to the hard challenges this poses is key to making sense of one of the most important trends reshaping the world in the 21st century. In a healthy economy, Naeem argues, teamwork outperforms command and control hierarchies of the past. In systems where one person dominates, dissent is squashed, conformity sets in, and the skills and knowledge all of the other people have don't get adequately utilized. The result is stagnation. The strength of your team depends on each individual, and the strength of each individual depends on the team. Unlike wolves, lobsters, or other animals, (laughs) we don't have to organize into crude dominance hierarchies to get things done. We are human beings with spoken language, books, and supercomputers in our pockets. We can create working environments in which everyone can be their fullest self and do their best work, thereby making the whole greater than the sum of its parts. And leaders who fail to do this will not be able to keep up to, to keep up with the dynamism and innovation from the teams of those who do. What, what good design looks like, two principles. In order to create radically respectful workplaces that are optimized for collaboration and honor each employee's individuality, leaders must apply two design principles to their management systems, checks and balances and bias quantifiers. All right, Ernest, that's a mouthful. What do you think? You know, I think it is, um, it's heavy. It's heavy, right? When you begin to really think about power and how power shows up in the workplace, I think um, it's really heavy. I, I think, you know, you talk about this, Kim, in here. And and I think it's 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 probably the management system to me that is the most robust and the most efficient at combating power, and that's asking for feedback. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> obviously, I love feedback. I was gonna say obviously I'm saying that to you, the feedback queen. So, <laughs> but I think I think that is you know if people can really understand how to listen to others and allow others to tell you when you're acting like an asshole. Yes. Or listen to others when they say that you are not empowering them or enabling them to do their best work. That for me, I have found as I have grown in my career to be able to listen to my team saying, you know what, you're not listening to us right now. Or at least having one or two people on your team who you really trust and who are the people you go to. You know, and even as an HR partner, I've had executives who I've been their HR partner, and that's the role that I've played is to check them when I see them doing something that is abuse of their power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's really hard to do that, though. It's really hard to speak truth to power. So where where do you get the courage to to do it? And have you had some experiences where you got punished for doing it? Oh, of course. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I would say I get the courage, you know, by – you know, I look at it to say if 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 I have been and I'm in a working relationship with someone and that person is more senior to me or holds more power inside the organization, I look at it as my responsibility, particularly as an HR person, to make sure that I'm not dealing with a bunch of issues down the road yeah. when I know I can prevent those issues up front. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. <laughs> cause inevitably they're coming. Yeah. Yes. But you are unusual, I think. I think most, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm Mm -hmm. going to say that most people, when they are confronted with someone who is more powerful than they are, Mm -hmm. who's behaving badly, Mm -hmm. who's who's behaving in what I would call obnoxious aggression, uh, or, or, or who's bullying others, who's abusing their power to bully others in a way that makes it, it's not a fair fight because it's so risky to, to push back. Yes. Uh, most people respond to that with what I call manipulative insincerity. They gossip mm-hmm. about that person behind their back. 
They don't yes. challenge that person directly. They do not respond with what I would call radical candor. And I put myself in this category. Like I, I worked for someone at some point and I, <laughs> um, we'll call him Basfi, short okay. for biggest asshole in Silicon Valley. And that is saying something. <laughs> that is really saying something. <laughs> And, uh, and what did I do? I quit. I just quit. I did, I did mm -hmm. not. I mean, I made a very half-hearted attempt to confront him and, and he brushed me aside like a fly and I just quit. Mm -hmm. Um, and I walked away from like a forever grant it was called yeah. a forever grant, uh, meaning I was supposed to stay at the company forever. forever. And, and, and I took a gigantic pay cut to quit. Yeah. Because I just couldn't stand being, but so, so, and I think that if there aren't checks and balances in a system and a person can get away with that kind of behavior, sometimes they do. Sometimes that, but like they're not, a le that leader was not like you. He was not going around looking for people to tell. Tell him when oh, he was behaving badly. Believe me, Kim, I've worked with enough of those. I mean, I can think of a, yes. of a fairly recent incident in my career where, you know, there was a leader who was completely unchecked in the yeah. amount of power that he wielded inside of the organization. And he did it to the point of intimidation and fear. Um, and and I, I will say in many of those instances, I retreated in, in my interactions with him. Yeah. Um, and and I spent a lot of time with my with my executive coach working through um how to not walk away and how to stand in the face of that. Yeah. But it is very scary. It's very scary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I, th I think you're right. I mean, I think it, it, it really, it really depends. And, and you and I were talking about this. I had a, a friend of mine who listens to the podcast and she was telling me that we really should be talking about the risk yes. associated with checking these things because she herself experienced to up to the point of losing her job because she was standing up against a system of power yeah. that had really begun to um, really become toxic in the culture of the organization. Yeah. And when she decided to take a firm stance on behalf of some other people, she yeah, was so then- She was an upstander. She was an upstander and all bullets and all everything pointed to her then at that point. Oh, wow. um, and she then ultimately lost her job as a result of it. And that was, you know, she's a single mom. She had four children. She has four children who were wow. young at the time. And so to then have to walk away from the career that she had built at this company where she had been for decades. Wow. Um, and just had the rug pulled out from underneath her. It was very, very challenging yeah. to say the it's, least. It's traumatizing, for her really. It's traumatizing. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So I think, you know, we come back to what do we do here and how do you put these checks and balances in yeah. into an organization? Um you know, it's 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 a really interesting one, but I think you're right. A lot of times, this work is given to HR. Yeah, and we are asked to then <laughs> define how to create these checks and balances. But we can do in HR, we can sit and write policies and procedures all we want. But if the leaders don't want to take it and indoctrinate it and 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 actually put it into process, it it's just words on paper. Yeah, yeah, and it applies to everyone except for. The, the person it most needs to, it most yes. needs to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, check. Right? Yes. Yes. The person yes. with the most power needs the biggest check on their power. I would argue. That's right. I agree with you. Uh, and, I agree and, with you. And I think, you know, you and I were also talking about how people, uh, shall we say overrepresented people with a lot of power <laughs> have, have not, I mean, in, in all seriousness, like I've had the benefit at, as, uh, being a, being a woman and I, I, you know, overall I've had more privilege than, um, mm. you know, than, than bias, uh, directed at me, but, but as a, as a, as a woman who's a leader, I really couldn't get away with being a jerk in the way mm -hmm. that my colleagues yeah. who, are, who are white men could get away with. And I'm, I'm not, I might have gotten away with it if I could have, I might've, I'm not saying that I'm like some kind of saint. I mean, I think yeah. all of us yeah. kind of yeah. are, are. Power's a drug. It can be yeah, a drug. Yeah, it can be a drug. It, yeah. it can absolutely be a drug. And so the question is, like, uh, I think especially um, people who haven't had to have, uh, 
have their power questioned or their yes. authority questioned as often as as you and I have are are more likely to behave like jerks, not because they are more likely to be jerks, but because mm-hmm. they've operated in a system that gave them unearned credit yes. <laughs> from the time yes. they were born. Yes. And um and so so like figuring out how to design a system so that everybody will learn in time not to act like a jerk seems to me to be really important. Because if we don't design our systems that way, then we're going to get systemic injustice, I think. I agree with you, Kim. I mean, but it still comes back to the question of how do you get leaders to request or support those systems when they themselves are sitting in the seat and abusing the power? They have to believe, they have to believe that it's in their long-term best interest. Uh, It's never going to be in their short-term best (laughs) interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's going to be painful. It's going to be painful for them. It's very very painful. Yes, yes, yes. Look, I, um, you know, one of the things I think that was helpful for me is to really understand this concept of, and Glennon Doyle talks about this in her book, Untamed, where she talks about almost this feministic view of power which really uh-huh. thinking about power as this, uh, all of us have an unending amount of power inside of us. Yes. And the systems that we've operated with in the world have put boxes and cages around us. And yes. when we began to understand how to open those cages and break out of those boxes, the power inside of us is unleashed. And that has been really helpful for me, particularly as I go up against the patriarchal view of power inside yes. of corporate America. Because... I think for so long I sat and I believed that power was either going to be given to me or I had to take it. Yeah. And that there was a finite amount of that power to go around. And that was a very deafening concept for me because as a gay black man, that was not something yeah. I felt like I was going to have access to anytime soon yeah. in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, in a meaningful way. And so when I began to think about it and say, I'm the master of my own destiny and I, how I speak up, how I use my voice, how I take up space in a room, how I challenge people sometimes without them even knowing I'm challenging, um, has really begun to be a game changer for me personally to now be able to break through some of these, some of these and begin to define systems around other people who have too much power. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if, what if we called it agency? We all have unlimited agency. I love that. I love that. To do, like to accomplish to yes. express who we are in the world right. and to accomplish uh, goals, not mm-hmm. not any goals, but <laughs> reasonable mm-hmm. goals, uh, goals that don't harm other people. So it's agency to be who you who you want to be, to become who you want to become, yes, and to have positive impact on the world. So unlimited yes. agency, but to me, power is too often power over someone else, and that's the problem. Uh, yes, uh, I think with 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 at least how, I mean, maybe it's a semantic rat hole, but how I'm defining power. No, I I think, I think that's right. I think that's right. But, but again, I go back to Kim and I say, we got to create some hope here in this. (laughs) And agency was my hope. You know what I mean? Like creating some hope here because otherwise this is the concept that we've lived in for decades and centuries of people yeah. who abuse power, they get more power, they turn into just absolute assholes and jerks. Yeah. And then no one ever checks them on that. Yes, yes. Right? And my my theory, not for world domination, because I don't want that kind of power, <laughs> but, but for world checks and balances yes. is like, because I think the vast majority of us hang out, I'm going to I'm gonna move away from just work and talk about radical candor for a moment. Okay. But so radical candor is care personally and challenge directly at the same time. And when you can do both, it's radical candor. But I call it radical candor, not because caring and challenging are so radical, but because that combination is patient. Yes, it's power. The vast majority of us, I think, wind up in this quadrant where you care personally, but you're so concerned about not hurting someone's feelings that you fail to challenge them directly. And that I call ruinous empathy. So if 90% of us make 90% of our mistakes in this ruinous empathy quadrant, if we can just move a little towards radical candor, then we then we don't give people who indulge in in what I call obnoxious aggression. That's where you challenge, but you don't show that you care. Yep. yep. Um, 
and the problem is that that obnoxious aggression is a little bit more effective than ruinous empathy in terms of mm-hmm. getting stuff done. But yes. those are not your two choices. You can be. You have other. You're right. You have other choices. Yes, to choose yes. Yes. you can care and to, you can be radically candid. And so that's yes. my, if 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 the major, the vast majority of people can just challenge. Uh, yes. problems when they see yes. them, especially obnoxious aggression, when they notice yes. it, then the world will be a better place. So that's my plan for for world checks and balances. Not for no, world. I appreciate that. I, I, I think that makes, and I think you're right that a lot of this has to do with how we talk to each other yes. and how we provide feedback to each other, right? Which is why radical candor is is such a wonderful tool for all of us to have, or a set of tools for all yeah. of us to have in our, in our arsenal. I mean, I think, you know, Kim, I worked at, at one of the companies, Danaher, one of the companies I worked for, um, Danaher has a, has a saying that is part of the culture, which is, it's mm-hmm. never the people, it's always the process. Yes. I love that. I love, right? love, love that. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and, and what I found with that was, that was such a wonderful way to challenge power. Yes. Be, right. Because the, the company, the culture itself said, we're not going to talk about the people. We're going to talk about the, the, the how we got there. And yeah. in that process is where the power is embedded. Yes. Yes. Right. And so you could really challenge in that moment. You could democratize it in that moment. You could spread it around and get more voices into the room at that time. So that's, I think, a great example of how you build a check and balance into yeah. a corporate culture to really challenge power, right? Is yeah. something as simple as saying, it's, I mean, it sounds simple, but it's very difficult to operationalize. Yeah. That it's never the people, but always the process. Yeah. And the process has to, the various management processes, like che- the, the checks and balances that I would suggest have to be put into place are on, on your hiring process, on your mm-hmm. pay process mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. your and, promotions yeah, promotions promotion, promotions probably i mean for me at least that like a huge part of my frustration in my career was getting consistently passed over for promotion yes and the reasons were always so blatantly gendered it was like it was remarkable right. to me That's um right. And, uh, and, and so that I care, but you know, I did get hired. Uh, and so maybe, maybe for others would say, well, you know, let's start with hiring. So hiring, pay, promotion, mm-hmm. also like who gets, who gets mentored and who doesn't yes. get mentored. The, the sort yes. of informal things are really important. And who and, gets sponsored and who doesn't get sponsored. Right. Yeah, I exactly. think in this case, sponsoring, it can be an even bigger breakdown of power. Yeah. So what's the, yeah. So what's the difference between sponsoring and mentoring? Uh, oh, yes. I, I want to know. <laughs> People have been talking about this. I'm like, oh, I'm not trying to know the answer. So, so, so as I use it here, sponsorship is when I'm using my power mm-hmm. to support someone else when they're not even in the room. Yes. Okay. Right. That is. So I am yeah. saying I'm in a room that's talking about this job or project that's coming up. Yeah. And I'm saying, you know what? I know Kim is capable of doing that. Let's put her on this project. Let's give her this opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's that is really important. So, you know, so here's an example of, of a good ch- uh, check and balance that a CEO who I was coaching put on their mm-hmm. power. So he noticed that he did not have any women on his team. And and to his credit, he assumed this was a problem with the promotion process, uh, not with the women at the company. <laughs> um, okay. And so he hired me to sit in on the next promotion Meeting. Yes, I love this. Uh, and, okay. and to notice, have I already told you this story? You haven't told me this, but I have a similar story, so I yeah. know where I know okay. where you're going to go. <laughs> so, so there's two people up for promotion: a man and a woman. And the they're they're ta- they're both great leaders. They both their teams, both of them have built exceptional teams or achieving exceptional results. And they're talking about the man and they refer to him as a real leader and a great leader. And and then we get to the woman and they refer to her as a real mother hen. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> back up the train, that's right. back up the train. That's right. That's right. Uh, we, that's your, pr- and they're like, oh, Kim, come on. Yeah. You know, we didn't get yeah. it that way. I'm like, who are you going to promote? The real mother hen or, or the, the real, real leader? leader. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's so right. What's your story, Ernest? Well, you know, look, I think I've sat in a lot of those conversations, Kim, particularly when we're doing talent yes. reviews um, across organizations. But one of the best tools I saw that a CEO did was we would come in to talk about people. 
Mm-hmm. And he would look at his leaders in the face and he say he would say to them, don't talk to me about the development plan that's on the paper. Mm-hmm. Talk to me face to face in words what you want to do to develop this person. Yeah. And he would say, give it to me in layman's terms. And when they began to talk, he would look at them ultimately and say, well, why didn't you write that on the paper? Yeah. What you wrote on the paper was a bunch of a bunch of words that don't yeah. ultimately speak to what needs to happen. <laughs> but what he was also really doing was challenging. He was putting a check. He was putting a check and balance in place. Right. Because on paper, we write these things. Oh, they're a real leader or she's a mother hen or she, you know, yeah. whatever the case may be. But when you say it out loud and you really get down to what you're really trying to develop or you're really looking yeah. for a person, we're much more expressive in the yeah. language that we use. Yes. Yes. Actually, there's a there's a good tool that will help folks with this around, uh, uh, especially around performance reviews, which where yes. a lot of a lot of bias turns into discrimination in the Big time. performance reviews and bullying. I mean, yes, <laughs> it, gets, bullying. It, gets to the, it gets to the point of bullying. Yes, and prejudice <laughs> too. Unfortunately, I, exactly, exactly. Um, so Textio will flag yes. language yes. in your performance reviews. Uh, and, and I think that is really helpful for people to, uh, to, to have their language checked in that way. I mean, it's automated, so it's not perfect, yeah. but, um, but it does scale. So that's great. Uh, and it'll it's get a great better. tool. It's a great yeah. tool. I mean, you, you, yeah. we, we've both talked about it. I, I used, I'm a big fan of Textio. And I think the ability be, be to, for someone who's sitting in their own home, when they're writing to be able to run it through a system that says, you know what, that was really gendered language that you were using and it yeah. was male dominated or female dominated. Yeah. And they don't have anyone else looking at them in those moments and they can really do some internal work. Yes. To say, wow, what was the language that I used that that I think that's one of the beauties of Textio is that it creates a place of self reflection for yeah, people in a safe environment. Defensive in the face of an yes. automated tool. I mean, I guess <laughs> It's possible, but uh, well, well, that's the whole AI conversation, which is yes. for a later date, Kim. Because yes. <laughs> we both we both know AI AI could be very biased. Oh my so, gosh! But. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Um, so, so I think another sort of check and balance is what I call bias quantifiers, right? Yeah, and tell that, me more. That, so that means like when you are bringing people in for interviews, okay, do the following. What percentage of the people who you're bringing in for interview are black? What percentage are uh, Latino or Latina? What percentage are white? What percentage are male men? What percentage are women? And uh, it's a sort of cut it by all, all the ways that you're trying to improve uh, uh, diversity on your team. And, and then ask yourself, what if we hid all the personally identifiable information on resumes, would we then, would it change? And like, you can hire somebody with a Sharpie. There's also tools you can use, but you can get rid of all that stuff and then do it again and notice, does it improve? And then you've identified bias uh, at the very beginning of your process. And that's going to help you. Usually when I've worked with teams that have done this, they, they have, they're, they're, they have better techniques. Yeah. The, I, and I look, I've seen it. I've done that, Kim, in workplaces, and I agree. It's a good tool. The challenge I have with it is that I want people to know that I'm black and gay for my resume. Yes. I, you, for, for, for me, that is where my power sits. It, it, it comes from yes. the life experience I've had. It comes from me identifying with my dem- demographics. And so when we begin to strip those things away from a resume, now all of a sudden I'm just on paper and, you know, it, 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 it does not show the full beauty, I think, of everything I have to bring to the table. So, you know, a, a, a system that was built to, to take out bias out of a process can to help take, give. Can take our humanity out of the process. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I think, I, think, I think the question is starting with the question, what problem am I trying to solve? Mm-hmm. Right. Before putting that in place, because if your problem truly is that, you know, you have a significant drop off point of underrepresented talent through your interview process. Mm -hmm. Right. If the beginning of your funnel was really large through two rounds of interviews, you find that you only have white people left at the end of those interviews. then yeah, you probably do need to dig in there and look at what's happening at each stage of the process and who's interviewing. 
Yes. How are you upskilling those folks yeah. uh, along the yeah. interview process? Yeah. Who are you bringing in? Yes. Are you doing a skills assessment? Yes. And then when you bring them in, are you making sure that you're looking for culture ad, not culture <laughs> fit? <laughs> That's, right. That That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, right. I agree. I don't think you need to strip personally identifiable information out of resumes for all time, but but do it and notice if then exactly if, then you've got to figure out like you, you, who's you know maybe you need to hire some uh, some additional talent to help you screen resumes. That's right. Uh, That's you right. Know. That's right. But I think I think you know look, Renee Myers, who's the head of diversity at Netflix, um, she was the first person I heard say this. She may not have authored it, but when she says. You know, you can't hire someone if they're not expected because yes. you can't respect them if they're not expected. And I love that because, you know, I would say to people all the time, we're going to do all this work to now bring people in. But the system of onboarding and the system of them walking into these power dynamics with their managers is not set up to truly support them. Yeah. And then when they get here, leave. it's like, and then there's going to yeah. Exactly. Right. So again, it's like, yeah, right. Have we understood where our problem actually exists and have we understood where power is being abused inside the organization? I'm right? glad you said that. I'm putting hiring last in the, yes. in this yep. section. It's actually going to start with the money. So yes. <laughs> once, you've, once you've made offers, make sure you're paying all the people you've made offers to fairly. Make yes. sure the ratings are fair. And and for that, you need checks and balances and you mm-hmm. need bias quantifiers. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. if you can design these systems to be fair, then you'll do better. You'll have a more fair uh, and and. By the way, I was going to call this book Radical Fairness. And then I'm like, fair means white. Damn it. Like, and you know what? <laughs> Candor also means white at the root. It, you, oh, don't, interesting. Like, you cannot escape. It's like Moby Dick. That's true. The white well, whale. No, <laughs> <laughs> no it's, it's, it's really true. Um, I, I, think, I think what you just said is, is, is spot on, Kim, right? Really understanding are we paying people appropriately? Are we bringing them in appropriately yeah. to appropriate jobs? Are we thinking about this at every step of the process? And here's the other thing I would say, you know, when, when these checks and balances are created, mm-hmm. people are going to bark at them and people oh, yes. are beca- because it's changed. But I would tell people that that those conversations, when people begin to bark, mm-hmm. that is the exact moment to double down. And that is the exact yeah. moment moment to really go in deeper because ultimately what we're saying is those people who are so fearful of these balances being put in are ultimately the people who need the work the most. Yes, yes. And I would also argue we're all fearful. Like when I first got yeah. Google, uh, Google is not perfect. It's definitely not perfect now and it wasn't perfect <laughs> when I was there, but it was pretty good on, yeah. on, on a lot of these things. And when when I first got there, they they had Shona Brown, who was the head of um, yeah. people operations and business operations at at Google. So she designed a lot of these systems, and she systematically stripped power away from the hands of all managers, directors, VPs. <laughs> Just maybe Love there are a couple of people who she didn't yes. whose power she didn't strip away from them. But anyway, mostly she did. And when I first got there, I was so frustrated. I'm like, I thought you hired hired me because I'm For really my, good I, at <laughs> you know building teams, and you're not letting me just hire whoever I want. You're making me go go through this process. And they sat me down and explained. And yep. and once it was explained to me, I was like, oh, that's brilliant. Yes, yep. check my power. I don't really want it. Uh, you know. Yeah. And so yeah. sometimes people just need need a, a reminder um, because I think, as you said, it's not the people necessarily. Yes. I mean, there are evil people in the world. I don't want to be too. We've but, talked about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mostly people are pretty good people. They are. I think the one thing you got to think about, and I think this is all for all of us as we're interviewing for jobs, as we are uh, understanding what we want to do with our lives and careers is maybe just say, I'm going to self-select out of that company. Yes. I'm not going to interview yes. with that company because I can see the writing on the wall. That power is so embedded yeah. in how that organization operates. I've been at a couple of these that y- 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 one person is not going to change that no. dynamic. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's really a question that people have to ask themselves through interview processes. Yeah. And as we do self select out, and as more and more and more people do, maybe, maybe they'll change the process. What yeah. was the what was the saying? It's always look at the process, not at the it's, people. It's, yeah, it's never the people, it's always the process. So let so I think you and I talked about this story, but I think we talked about it when we weren't recording. 
So remember I told you about going to the Billie Eilish concert? Oh, yes. <laughs> and, and so Billie Eilish is a person who really prides herself in creating a-, a Democratizing a kind, power, a, yes. Well, a kind environment. Like my yeah. daughter is a fan. That's why I was at the concert. I was the by far the oldest person there. Kim, and it's okay. You can say you're a fan. It's okay. I, I'm, I'm a fan. I, I am a fan. But, I, but I was, I'm not the demographic of her fans. And so, so she talks, she jumps in, she says, there's only two rules, have fun and don't be an asshole and don't judge each other. So she's trying yeah. to create this and she succeeds, I think, yeah. brilliantly. Big time. But, but my daughter and I were, my daughter is a super fan. I wanted to get right up to the, right up to the barricade. And so we had spent the night uh, <laughs> uh, outside the forum the night before, and we were almost all the way up to the barricade. And this guy, this big mm -hmm. guy yep. pushes his way to the front and is really kind of awful. Jumps in front of my daughter is shoving the woman in front of him, who's a black mm -hmm. woman. Mm -hmm. Um, just pushing her, you know, just yeah, because he's six inches taller than anybody else around him, and uh, you know, I did not use what's the saying again? It's blame the blame the process. you blame the person, not the yeah, problem, not the process. That yes, asshole, you know. <laughs> and when the concert was over, this woman who he had pushed and I just <laughs> rah, 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 like, <laughs> attacked him, full on <laughs> attack. And then I thought about it later and I was like, you know, if I were six inches taller than everybody around me, mm -hmm. mightn't I have shoved my way to the front too? Like the problem, I mean, he shouldn't yeah. have done that. It would have been better. Right. But anytime you have an environment where if you push to the front, you get what you want. Some That's right. people are going to push the, like the problem was the system. That's right. Oh, no, like I completely agree with you. And I would even say, I have a friend who's very, very tall. He's like six, six. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of conversations and uh, there's times when he wishes he was not that tall. Yeah. Cause be he can't get away. I could probably be pushier than he could. I'm that's five, exactly, I'm five that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Right. So yeah. again, it's not the people it's, it's, it's the system and the process yeah. that's built. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. All well, right. Stuff, well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And uh, we'll talk more next week. Let us know what you think. We're always looking for your feedback. We are soliciting your radical candor. <laughs> Take Have a care. Good week, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.